Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. In this podcast, Tim and I, a PRI's Director of Communications, and I chat with Professor Gary Wolfram, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Hillsdale College. Professor Wolfram shares his thoughts on some of the hot topics in the debate over economic policy today, including the Green New Deal, electric car subsidies, the growing push for socialism, and the debate over free college. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's Next Round, Professor Wolfram. Well, thank you for having me. So the, the 2020 election is shaping up as a fascinating contest between free market ideas and individual opportunity on one side and the push for socialism and more government control of our lives on the other side. So let's talk about some of these you know, often misguided proposals from the presidential candidates. First, there's, there's Elizabeth Warren and her push for tuition-free college. So this is something that we've seen pushed in California and other states. Others are proposing the elimination of college debt altogether. You've argued that free college would not be quite the deal that these Democratic candidates are expecting. Explain what you mean there. Well, there's a couple things. One is if if you reduce the price of uh, college education, what's going to happen is the more people are going to want it, right? If the price goes down, people will move into it. But the problem is you're going to be misallocating resources in the sense that people will end up going to college that would be better off doing something else. In particular, there's a shortage of uh, construction workers. Um, the Associated Builders and Contractors, 80% of them have said they have a shortage of labor. There's a shortage of 50,000 truck drivers. Uh, so we would be pushing people in there, encouraging people to come into college that their time would be better spent doing something else. And we find that only about a third of all the people that go into colleges that have open enrollment end up graduating within six years. So what they're more likely to do is be doing uh, a misallocation of their time. They would be better off doing something where they'd be more productive. And they find this out after two or three years. Actually, Jim Buchanan talked about this decades ago uh, in a book that if when you when you lower the price of college education below what the true marginal cost is, you get a misallocation. More people going to college than the marginal benefit of going to college uh, would would uh, entail. I think one of the, the primary things that you get with government intervention in higher education is suppose that the federal government says, you know what, we're going to let people have free college education. Well, what does that entail? If you're Lake Superior State University in Michigan, what does a free college education mean? Is the government now going to say, well, you have to have this class and this, and then a class and another thing, and a class and that, and you have to offer these. So what's going to happen is that you're going to get more and more government intervention telling us what we have to teach in higher education. And we already do that. In fact, I wrote a piece back 1990s, maybe, uh, for the KU Institute looking at um, the problem with government intervention in higher education. And what it does is it makes it so that the when once they start handing out money, then they're becomes all these strings attached with it. And this program of, oh yeah, it sounds good, free college education for everybody, but once the government is paying for it, then it's going to have an incentive to start saying, well, here's what education is. And Hillsdale College, it not only doesn't take any government money, but it doesn't, its students don't take government money because it wants to maintain it, the independence of its higher education. And this is what, you know, we're going to teach about the Constitution and the other things that we feel that the students ought to learn. Whereas, once you have this system of free college education, then you're just asking for the government to tell us, here's what higher education means. You know, I would agree with you there. You know, a lot of community college students have to take, for example, calculus. Well, you know, some just cannot pass calculus. And they're at a community college for a reason. Maybe they're getting a vocational nursing license and so on and so forth. And what ends up happening is they don't graduate because they they don't have the ability to, to pass some of these core courses that they might not actually ever really need. The government may be telling you, here's what you have to teach in your politics class, or here's, you, you have to have a course in uh, diversity, or you have to have whatever the ha- happens to be the, uh, you know, the flavor of the day. What's going to be happening is the Department of Education will be telling the colleges and universities, here's what you have to teach. 
presidential candidate Andrew Yang has gained a, a following on the campaign trail from his Yang gang supporters for his push for universal basic income. Now, we know that some on the free market side have even advocated for basic income as a way to help the poor. What are your thoughts on this debate? Is this an efficient way to help those in need and encourage growth in the consumption economy? Or is it really just the government paying people to do nothing? Milton Friedman talked about this uh, decades ago, again, as, as what he called a negative income tax. And so what would happen under a negative income tax is you would get rid of all these social programs that we have, NAP program and Section 8 housing and everything like that. And you would get, if you earned zero income, you would get a certain amount. And then as your income rose, there would be a tax uh, that would be the same for everybody. You got, let's say, $20,000 uh, a year uh, as your negative Negative income tax as you and you earned ten thousand. Then what would happen is you'd you'd be paying taxes on that first ten thousand, but you wouldn't lose all the twenty thousand. You'd only be losing the at the margin. One of the problems with the current system is you have very high marginal tax rate. Now, let's say you went and worked and earned twenty thousand dollars. Well, what would happen? Well, you might lose your Section Eight housing. You'd lose your SNAP program. You lose your Medicaid. So you could easily end up having less income than uh, if you uh, had worked. So the, the, you, the negative income tax is a plausible way of dealing with this. It doesn't tax your earnings at more than 100%, which can happen the way we have our current system. But you would get rid of all the other programs. I mean, that would be the key, that you wouldn't have Medicaid, Section 8 housing, all this other stuff. You just say, okay, here's how much you get if your income zero, and that gets taxed away as you earn income. And, and and that, I think, would be uh, have a much uh, better effect on people's work behavior than the current system that we have. Socialism has been growing in popularity in recent years, especially among college students and, and millennials. So there's been considerable discussion on the free market side about how best to impart to young people the dangers of socialism. You talk to students every day about free market economics at Hillsdale, of course, a friendlier environment. What are your thoughts on how to change the hearts and minds of young people about socialism? And why do you think there is this growing popularity uh, on socialist ideas in the first place? Well, I think a couple of things. One is the popularity of socialism is there because students have not really been taught how markets work. How, how is it that iPhone that they're using to call their friend or to look on Facebook, how did that get there? That got there through the market process. And so we need to start explaining, here's how markets work. For example, um, I tell my students, Look, 9 million people woke up in New York City today and there was exactly the right amount of Starbucks coffee and there was exactly the right amount of bagels and exactly the right amount of peanuts. And it happened uh, the day before and it's going to happen next month. And it's happened all over the country. That is, there's no central planner in charge. And yet we should wake up every day and say, oh my gosh, this is just uh, incredible that there's always the right amount of stuff at every retail outlet in America at every moment in time. And the reason is because the price system works. So that if there were too much Starbucks coffee, what would happen? Well, then the price of Starbucks coffee would fall. People would buy more Starbucks coffee and Starbucks would make less coffee and we'd get to the point where the demand and supply were equal. If a central planner tried to do that, imagine if what we did is we just even turned over uh, toilet paper to the secretary of toilet paper and asked them to have the, the right amount of toilet paper at every retail outlet in America at every moment in time. Well, you know, your intuition is, gee, that can't possibly work. But students haven't been taught to think through or analyze how this that sort of the magic of the market system work. And they have no background really on on socialism. They don't really know what socialism is. They're most of the millennials, well all the millennials, were born after the fall of the Soviet Union. And they don't they don't get much information on what's going on in places like Venezuela, where socialism is destroying the economy and causing millions of people to flee the country. So I think that's that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we need to explain why it is that market capitalism is good for poor people. That is an emphasis that we tend not to do. Um, but if you think about it, um, just intuitively, if you were to be born in any country in the world and you could pick it, and you were told you were going to be the 
poorest person in that country, you're not going to pick Venezuela, North Korea, Democratic Republic of Congo, right? You're going to pick a country that looks more like a market-based market based economy. The uh, Fraser Institute has an index of economic freedom where they rank countries by how close they are to a free market system. And if you take the poorest people, the people on the bottom 10% of the income distribution, if you're in the countries that are in the top 25% of economic freedom, you're 11 times wealthier than if you were in the bottom 25% of economic freedom. So if we really just sort of think through, we will we'll be able to, again, observe that, or one important thing about market capitalism is that it is the system that creates the greatest wealth for the poor. And we shouldn't be focusing on inequality. What do I care how rich Bill Gates is? We should be, in, you know, what Mises called the politics of envy. We should be focused on how wealthy are the poor. And in countries where where we have market capitalism, the poor are very wealthy compared to places that have a a truly socialist system. Trade policy is another big issue on the presidential campaign trail. We've seen in in recent months the stock market show increasing volatility as President Trump has engaged in a trade war with China. And meanwhile, we're seeing that Congress has yet to ratify this new USMCA trade deal with Canada and Mexico. Some economists have argued that the the president's actions on tariffs are actually accelerating our natural push toward an economic downturn. So what are your thoughts on the president's trade policies? And we're going to ask you to use your crystal ball. How do you think this ongoing trade dispute with China is going to ultimately be resolved? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, we have to realize that trade is between individuals and not countries. That is, there's no such thing as the United States out there trading with Canada or the United States out there trading with China or any place else. What's going on is individuals are trading with one another. You uh, buy something from Walmart that was made in China. Well, Walmart traded with the person that made the thing in China, and then you traded with Walmart. And trade is one of the things that leads to economic growth. I mean, imagine if you uh, lived on Gilligan's Island, right? You, you couldn't trade outside of Gilligan's Island. Well, you wouldn't live very well. Whereas if you have trade, then you have access to all sorts of things that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Uh, if we look at why it was that the Western world got so rich, it's because what we call the trading cities that developed in starting in the 11th century. And trade improves the lifestyle of and the the amount of output of all parties that are involved in trade. And remember that trade is a voluntary exchange uh, and market economies are, are voluntary exchange. I can't force you to buy my product. You can't force me to buy your labor. So whenever there's a trade, both parties had to get better off. So by impeding trade, what we're doing is we're making so that both parties can't come to an agreement that would make themselves both better off. We also reduce the incentives for you to be innovative. If you can uh, take if you take on the risk of innovation, but you're not able to sell your product or your service to uh, other people because there is a government barrier to that, then you'll have less incentive to be innovative. So trade acts as a downgrade of our economy. It makes us less wealthy and less productive. So trade barriers, in particular tariffs, is one of the trade barriers that's been used recently. What does that do? That's going to make it so that we're all less wealthy. Now, if we think through why we want to have trade, we might want to have trade just based on individual liberty. As I said before, trade is between individuals, not governments. So why should the government tell me I shouldn't be able to trade with somebody else? Well, there's also a lot of confusion as if a trade deficit is a bad thing. A trade deficit is actually a good thing because suppose that people want to invest in the United States. They, uh, you know, Germans want to build a factory in the United States. Well, how are the Germans going to get the dollars that they're going to use to buy the factory or to hire the workers in the United States. The only way that they can get those dollars is to have the United States buy more stuff from Germany or buy more stuff from other countries than we buy from them. So a trade deficit is the equivalent of what economists call a capital surplus. If I said to you the the United States ran a $300 billion capital surplus last year, you'd go, wow, that sounds pretty good. And it would be good because it says that people will, uh, other countries, 
countries will have invested $300 billion more in the United States than we invested somewhere else, which shows that we have a growing economy. Whereas if I told you we have a $300 billion trade deficit, you might say, oh, that's a bad thing. But in fact, you can't have the capital surplus without the trade deficit. So there's a lot of confusion there. Trade deficits are a good thing. And the, and trade itself is uh, allows for economic growth, and we've known that historically since the 11th century. So trade barriers, the tariffs, are a dampening of both the United States economy and the world economy in general. Now, if what's going on is you're saying, well, gee, we're going to have tariffs on China, uh, Chinese goods. And remember that if I put a tariff on Chinese goods, it's Americans that pay for that, right? Because it's a tax on people buying the Chinese goods. If I put a tax on that in order to downgrade the Chinese economy in the hopes that they will respect intellectual property rights, well, that's now a strategy. That's that's saying, okay, we think that the cost being imposed on our economy is going to be more than offset by the Chinese deciding that they're now going to respect intellectual property rights because the cost to their economy is sufficiently great from the tariffs that we place on them. Now, whether that is a is a good strategy or not is, is beyond my pay grade. Someone would have to say, gee, I think that the Chinese are going to succumb to this and I think that they are going to respect intellectual property rights and that's going to be better for everybody or that we'd be best off if we eliminated all tariffs. And I think President Trump said that at the G7 meeting a, a while ago. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be good. We And Congress itself needs to act in, in, and, and pass the new trade agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, because that will allow goods and services that and inputs to move across borders and will make us all more productive. Another economic issue looming on the horizon is a national debt. And unfortunately, none of the presidential candidates, including President Trump, are talking about fiscal responsibility and, and spending restraint. To the contrary, most of the Democratic candidates are embracing expensive proposals like the Green New Deal uh, or Medicare care for all that would uh, entail much higher taxes. What are your thoughts on politicians in both parties essentially ignoring their responsibility on spending in the debt, which if goes uncontrolled could be catastrophic for this country's long-term prosperity? Yes, well, there's a couple things about the national debt. One is that, as um, Jimmy Buchanan and Dick Wagner pointed out in in the 1970s, is that if you ignore the effects of debt, you think that it's okay to just go ahead and run deficits. Well, will that do? It will appear as if government services are less expensive than they really are. And so we will vote for people who are going to expand the government because we don't have to raise the taxes to do that. And and so you get this expansion of government through a mispricing of what government services are. And it, it's important that we tell people, you know what, at some point, you're going to have to pay for this. Now, in the future, it may be that that's what's happening. It may be that we can get by in the short run from doing that. And in fact, Adam Smith talked about this in his book, An Inquiry to the Nature of Causes of the Wealth of Nations. He said, well, when if you run public debt sufficiently large, what will happen is at some point, people don't want to buy that debt. Now, what happens in the United States is when a bond comes due, let's say a $1,000 bond came due today, how does the government pay for that bond when you turn your bond in? Well, it sells another bond to somebody else, and it takes a thousand dollars that it got from the from the new bond that they just sold and pays off the old one. Well, that'll work as long as people are willing to buy the new bond. At some point, if people start saying, you know, you know what, I'm a little bit worried because uh, I'm not sure that the that they're going to be able to pay back this trillion, you know, twenty trillion dollar debt, and so they get concerned about that and they stop buying government bonds. And when that happens, then the government isn't able to make its payments, and then you end up with with, with problems. Now, realistically, um, we don't have the same problem that, let's say, Greece does because we pay our debt back in dollars and and dollars are like Doritos. We can just make more. Realistically, the federal government is not going to default on its debt because it could always create the dollars to do that. But here's the problem. The government is going to be making more dollars and if it makes more dollars relative to the amount of output, then it costs more dollars to buy stuff which is what inflation is. So the real issue here is, well, at some point, we have to start uh, start producing uh, inflationary amounts of money. 
money in order to pay back this debt. And that is what happened. what's happening in Venezuela. That's what happened in Zimbabwe. Now, realistically, is the United States going to end up there? No, not likely. But long term, we do have to be concerned about it. But here's the thing. Most of your federal spending is mandatory. That is, if you shut the government down tomorrow, like you shut Congress down tomorrow, the vast majority of spending will still be going out the door. You could eliminate all of the non-defense discretionary spending that are in the that are in the budget bills. You could eliminate all of that and you'd still end up with a deficit of over four hundred billion dollars. That's because we spend trillions of dollars on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Those problems have to be addressed before you can start dealing with the the large deficit. Unfortunately, that is going to be the third rail of politics, right? I mean, how many, you know, there's there's not many people running for Congress that say, hey, guess what? We got to deal with this Social Security issue or the Medicare issue that you've got trillions of dollars of unfunded liabilities in Medicare, Medicaid, and, and, uh, and Social Security. And those those, those programs go on unless you pass a bill to reduce them. And so you need a majority of both houses and the signature of the president to reduce spending on the mandatory spending, which is the vast majority of government spending. And so that is the real hard problem, I think, that needs to be addressed. It, you know, it's going to take a while and people are going to have to start saying, well, you know what? We just can't fund the Social Security system the way it is and we can't fund Medicare the way it is. Now, the way to do that is to to all, you know, there's, this could be a whole nother program is how you deal with Medicare and change the uh, incentives of the Medicare system and the Medicaid system. Those that, you know, those are government programs that encourage uh, all sorts of uh, excess spending and, and misallocation of resources in the health care. Let's turn to the environment. States like California have been getting into the car sales business by pushing taxpayer funded subsidies to purchase electric cars or build charging infrastructure. This is an area where PRI has done uh, significant research, and we've concluded that these are little more than costly giveaways to the rich. And, you know, it's likely that certainly any of the Democratic candidates would pursue this approach at the federal le- level if they are elected. Speaking as, as an economist, what are your thoughts on electric car subsidies? You know, should government really be playing car salesmen? And how do you respond to advocates for these subsidies who argue that they're necessary to grow? a market for electric cars in the first place. Well, you're exactly right. These car subsidies are simply subsidies to the wealthy. If you look at the who buys these cars like Teslas, etc., um, you'll find that wealthy people buy them. And they're not very efficient in terms of if you're trying to do is uh, reduce global warming. It turns out that when you when you go to charge your car, uh, when you look at the net the net carbon emissions from having to generate the electricity to, to produce the the energy to charge your car, it turns out that it's probably greater carbon emissions from driving around with electric cars. Now, the batteries get better, maybe that will change, but nonetheless, it makes a little sense to be giving a benefit to people who are wealthy for something that has almost no marginal effect on the reduction of emissions, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, and realistically, think how expensive it is to uh, put the infrastructure in. Uh, you'd have to have charging stations all over the place, and we know realistically um, that's that's not likely to happen, uh, you know, in the next 20 years anyway. And if if this is all going to work out, then the, then the market will make it happen, right? Some Somebody will invent, you know, a new battery that lasts for 2,000 miles or something like that. I mean, if that, that that's what will happen if the mar- if the, if we allow the market to work. And so again, by by doing this, we're misallocating resources. We're getting people buying cars where the marginal cost of that car is less than the marginal benefit. Uh, so we're wasting resources. Sources and who's gaining from this? You know, who gains from this are the stockholders of Tesla or are the owners of Tesla, and who's paying for it are the um, the average person. Professor Wolfram, um, recently the Business Roundtable announced that it had redefined the purpose of a corporation to include quote improving our society. PRI Sally Pipes has written about this, and it's it's ludicrous. She cited Milton Friedman's vision of the quote one and only social responsibility of business is to 
use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits as long as it stays within the rules of the game. How do you explain this trend among large corporations? Uh, what's at play here? Well, I mean, Milton Friedman was right. That is, if you, why would we think that the directors of a corporation would know better what to do with the profits that it has than the owners of the company, that is the stockholders? If the stockholders want to take the profits or the dividends from that company or take the capital gains from that company and, and give it away to their favorite charity, then that's the way we ought to do it. Now, the, I, I believe what's going on here is that there's sort of two things. One is, I think that the way the federal government has been so active in interfering in the market-based system that the owners of the corporations uh, are looking at this and going, you know what, I think the government is going to come in and start telling us what to do. Maybe what we ought to do is to try to get ahead of the politics of this thing, and we will say that we will do it ourselves. A second thing is that it's possible that this could be efficient if what was going on is, let's say you are selling organic vegetables or something like that. And if you think that your your customers would prefer to have organic vegetables, let's say you're Kroger's and you're selling you know organic vegetables in your store, you might say, okay, if the customers want that, then the customers may start buying your products or going to your store because you're offering this. Or you might say, you know what, we're only going to buy cloth from uh, countries that uh, pay their workers a certain amount. If you think that your particular customers would pay more for your your product if you advertise this, well then that you know that's okay. I mean, what's really going on is the company is still just profit maximizing, right? It's just profit maximizing be- be- because it's 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 doing what it, it's, it thinks its consumers would want to have done. But if they're doing it by saying, oh, the uh, corporate executives, we know best what to do with these resources and we're going to do things that we think is socially beneficial. Well, that's a little bit different because what's what's really socially beneficial is to use resources in the way that benefits the consumer the best. And the way to use resources to benefit the consumer the best is to have the lowest marginal cost of producing and to produce things at uh, you know innovative ways and let the consumers decide whether they want to buy the thing or not. So, you know, again, if what's going on is I uh, am agreeing to this because I think it's going to attract consumers to my business and I think people are willing to pay more for a product that is made in a certain way or they're going to they're going to want to come to buy stuff at my store because they they you know, they somehow feel better uh, if they think that the clerk is getting paid more than it is at some other store and that's going to attract people to my store. Well, then that that's profit maximization. But if you're just doing it because somehow you think that that's the socially right thing to do, then that's not going to be that's not going to be socially efficient. Let let the stockholders decide what they want to do with their money. I suspect that what's going on is that particularly with regard to wage uh, wage expenditures, that is if you are a large company like Walmart, you can substitute what we call capital for labor. That is you can substitute automated checkout counters you can substitute robots to clean up better than can the local hardware store or better than can the local grocery store. And so I could be, you know, if Walmart is, is it could say, well, we want to raise wages and make everybody else raise wages, then they might be doing that because it gives them an advantage over the, the, the local uh, businesses, the local small business. So there's a, you know, there's a, a lot of ways to look at the, uh, what, what, what people are saying, uh, what, you know, that, that people may be telling you one thing, but they really are meaning something else. Not that that would ever happen, but I, I, I you know, I would be careful, very careful about uh, companies wanting to to say we know what's best for society as a whole. But, you know, us the uh, the directors of the company, and so we're gonna we're gonna divert some of the profits uh, to those things. As we close, it's another trend in the business world is this push for more investment in environmental, social, and governance investing. It's more commonly known as ESG and. PRI's Wayne Weingarten has done a lot of analysis in this area, and he makes the case that these funds may be appropriate for individual investors, but they've significantly underperformed traditional investments and should be avoided by public pension funds. So what are your thoughts on this growing push for ESG and public pension funds that are making investments?
investment decisions based on politics rather than their fiduciary responsibility to both taxpayers and retirees. Well, actually, I I also wrote a piece on this. And one of the differences, if let's say uh, you decide to invest, you know, an individual investor, and you decide to invest in a company that, you know, has uh, or a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund that focuses on businesses that are environmentally sound or that do this, that, or the other thing, that's up to you to do that. And if they, you know, if you want to invest that way and makes you feel better that way, then that, that's fine. That's up to you. You you will, in general, be receiving less of a rate of return than if you had just in, invested in, uh, you know, Fidelity Mutual Fund or something. But you, you you know, that that may make you feel better. However, if you're a pension fund, then what happens is I you're the, the the pension fund, let's say you're the state of California's retirement fund. And so what happens is all the people that are uh, retirees, their pension money is being invested in, in a way that they don't get to control. And these social funds, um, out, they, they underperform just going out there and investing in in uh, uh, indices or investing in, in, in stocks based on what we think the, the best rate of return is. And there's only two uh, large companies that advise the pension funds on on what to invest in, and they they move towards the socially preferred funds. Again, it's a difference between if you as the individual investor choose to invest in these, uh, these funds that are looking at social values, and you're willing to accept a lower rate of return in order to do that, that's fine. But if I am a, uh, let's say I'm a state of California retiree, I don't, want my, necessarily my my pension fund invested that way. I want a pension fund that's going to maximize the amount of returns so that I can get a uh, as large a pension as possible. And then if I want to, on my own, take my money and go out and give it away to people, or I want to invest my own money in you know whatever program I want to, then then I should be able to do that. Well, Professor, as we uh, as we close here, you know, one of the things that we love nothing more to do than uh, is to discuss public policy while having a favorite adult or other beverage. So what what is your favorite beverage that you uh, would recommend to our listeners when they're diving into these meaty economic policy issues? Well, um, my wife always gives me a bad time because I don't have any real sense of smell, and so I don't really have a very good sense of taste. Um, and so I prefer beer as long as it's cold. And so uh, what I prefer then is as long as the, all the beer tastes the same to me, uh, I might as well get the cheap beer. And so uh, if I were to go out and you know buy a 24 pack, I buy natural ice. Um, as I say, you know, every day is an outer day. Um, now my my kids give me a real bad time about this. Um, you know, they want to have some really super nice craft beer, uh, and and I'm out there buying the beer that's you know 50 cents a can or something like that. So uh, you know, I'm sort of plebeian in my taste for beer, but I would say that uh, Natty Ice is is my favorite. Oh, well, I'm surprised by that. I would have thought your cool factor would have gone up in your kids' eyes because that Natty Ice or PBR is another one of the on the inexpensive end. Those have kind of a cult following. Though. I found. <laughs> well, that's probably true. <laughs> oh, you're you're well, yeah. hyper cool. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Professor. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Special thanks to our guests, Professor Gary Wolfram and to Tim Anaya. If you're in the Southern California area, join us on November 9th for our Baroness Margaret Thatcher dinner in Newport Beach. Our keynote speaker is entrepreneur and philanthropist Peter Thiel. For more information, go to our website at pacificresearch.org. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.